And I'm joined by Stephen Shihai. Um, welcome to Alternate Focus. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Um, my first question is, uh, you have a book coming out about Islamophobia. How did you get interested in Islamophobia? Um, that's a good question. You know, I grew up uh, as Arab American, um, you know, obviously subjected to run-of-the-mill anti-Arab prejudices and stereotypes. And I realized in the 1990s that things were slowly shifting in terms of way, the way that prejudice was being framed and presented. Um, and it was moving away from just a generic Arab stereotype of the Muslim Sheikh or the Palestinian terrorist to something more um, religion specific and region specific. Um, so it started, to, it started to marry those old Arab stereotypes with new sort of uh, religious overtones. And you, st you say that this current um, type of Islamophobia started around the Cold War. Talk about what, sh what shifted then and how it changed, how, what, it, what form it takes. Well, I think, you know, um, I use as almost an arbitrary watershed um, a Gulf War um, one. Depends which Gulf, I mean, what perspective you're talking about, but from the United States perspective, it's Gulf War One, um, where the Soviet Union had pretty much um, disintegrated and the United States had come to um, the forefront. The world had become, in other words, a unipolar power. You know, there was no longer two superpowers, there was one. And so s within the 1990s, after uh, the sort of shift, the fall of the Soviet Union, the end of the Cold War, the United States started to articulate uh, a new discourses of Islamophobia, new rhetorics of Islamophobia to justify their presence now militarily and economically all over the world, but in particular uh, North Africa, Africa, the Middle East, South Asia. You start the, uh, the current phase of Islamophobia, the current type of Islamophobia, somewhere around the Cold War, Gulf War um, era. Why do, you, why do you pick that moment? Right. It's in the beginning of the 1990s that the United States shifts from the Cold War to becoming the preeminent superpower in a unipolar globe. Uh, um, and so the United States was no longer challenged or checked by uh, a, a, another bloc, the Soviet bloc. Uh, so they needed to, or I don't want to say they needed because it's not some sort of concerted effort within, you know, some, you know, the hundredth store of the, you know, Empire State Building. Um, but discourses on Islamophobia, rhetoric about Islamophobia starts to become articulated in the 1990s, uh, particularly targeting Muslims and it's there to justify the United States' interests in the Middle East, in North Africa, even in uh, Sub-Saharan Africa and in uh, South Asia and Central Asia. And then when you talk about Islamophobia, what exactly are you saying? Is it, is it people going out on the streets and, you know, painting signs on mosques, or is it something different than that? Right. Oh, Islamophobia means a lot. Not necessarily a lot of different things, but a lot. And definitely there are differences between Islamophobia, for example, in the United States and Islamophobia in Europe. I think there are two different pedigrees ideologically. The, the, I, uh, the Islamophobia that I concentrate on in the United States is, uh, is, is to put it simply, uh, a hate or a fear of Muslims. Um, and an understanding that Muslims are fundamentally different than other people than white America, than Westerners, whatever. So Islamophobia is a, uh, is a hate of, the, uh, of Muslims based on cultural, social, and religious criterion. And what effect does that um, have? What are the, the actual impacts on Muslims in America? Well, uh, this is the thing. I mean, the, 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 the impact is, is multi-level. Right on the on the run of the day mail, uh, level, uh, you know, you have just Muslims being subjected to mild to extremely violent hate acts, whether they're speech acts, being called names, whether they're it's job discrimination, whether they're issues about 
um, you know, whether uh, a Muslim girl can play soccer or be a waitress or whether uh, because she might be wearing a hijab, a headscarf, uh, you know, uh, d declaring, um, uh, you know, the head, the qutra, um, not part, n not allowed because it's not part of uh, dress codes, these sorts of things. Bullying in schools, harassment, you know, being called racist names. I mean, those are sort of unpleasant daily, you know, manifestations of Islamophobia that most Muslims would come across. Sometimes it gets more violent than that. There are, have been innumerable, especially over the past couple of years, mosque um, arson attacks, uh, gas attacks in, in Ohio, vandalism, uh, you know, uh, uh, families have been terrorized, you know, bricks through windows, notes on cars saying, get out. Um, so. Uh, on the daily level, on the ground level, there are just is you know, a plethora of just you know simple violent acts that people are subjected to, being beat up. I mean, lots of this. I think more on a more dangerous level, Islamophobia is is manifested in state policy, and uh, whether at, at the, the the federal level or at the level of the city and the state. You know, Islamophobia is used as a, a tool or a foil to implement a lot of uh, policies that would un otherwise be unacceptable policies that violate people's civil rights. In this case, they're targeted at Muslim Americans. Talk about some of those policies. Like, what are the ones that stand out for you? Well, the, well, the one that stands out the most, and uh, that's most recent, is um, a law that was passed. Um, by Congress called the uh, National Defense Authorization Act. And it was a bipartisan uh, law presented by uh, John McCain and uh, Carl Levin of M M Michigan. And uh, it's a law that legalizes a lot of the policies <coughs> that the Obama administration um, had continued regarding the illegal detention of terrorist suspects. Um, those, those policies were started by the Bush administration and then regularized and, uh, uh, and, and institutionalized by uh, the Obama, uh, uh, Obama administration, who's very deliberate. I mean, they're very, uh, uh, President Obama is a very intelligent man. He's a constitutional lawyer. He, and what he did is he, he, he really took the, these Bush um, policies and, and regularized them in such a way that, that could make them legal. Now, with a defense authorization bill, for example, he uh, uh, signed on to that and endorsed it. And what that bill does, for example, is it says that the United States government can arrest anyone in the world, whether they're an American citizen or a non-American citizen, um, on, if they're a suspect of being a terrorist and have an intent to harm the United States, or, and this is more, I think, insidious, if they are suspected in supporting terrorism or a terrorist organization. And that's, you say, okay, fine, that's normal, right? Um, but the, 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 the bill says that the, that defendant who's arrested and accused of that, it can be put in jail without any charges indefinitely forever. The state does not have to produce evidence. The evidence can be secret evidence. In the United States, it's a very dangerous thing because not only does it ta target Amer or, uh, uh, American citizens um, and, and completely nullify uh, habeas corpus where the, United, the government has to produce evidence to charge you um, and, in fact, has to charge you for a crime. And this doesn't makes it so you don't even have to be charged with a crime. Um, but also, you're remanded to the military. So if a civilian... Um, the police force, for example, picks you up, suspects you of terrorism, they hand you to the military in the United States, and then you're detained indefinitely and can be there until you rot. So that's, I mean, and that is, that law is predicated on the fact that there's something called a, uh, a Muslim threat, a, 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 a threat from Islamic terrorists. So, I mean, they're not talking about 
you know, KKK threats. You know, they're not talking, they specifically, this is specifically intended to fight the war on terror. And what would you say to people who would argue, look, we're focused on Muslims because we were attacked by Muslims. Right. Uh, I mean, that's a common argument you hear. How, would you, how do you respond to that? Um, it's a very prevalent article uh, or argument. And um, I think one thing we have to say is that there's no reason for re-engineering civil liberties in this country. That um, number two is that any act, any violent act committed against the United States or against Americans is a criminal act. And therefore, it should be subject to criminal prosecution in the due process by which the Constitution affords. Um, we all know that Muslims uh, are a huge and diverse community. There is no such thing as an, an American community of Muslims or a, a Muslim American community. I mean, they're so diverse. There are black Muslims, there are, there are Pakistani Muslims, there are Arab American uh, Muslims, there are, uh, Ar within those Arab American Muslims, there are Palestinians. There are, I mean, so we have so many, we are, there are converts, there are poor Muslims, there are well-off Muslims. So what happens is, is that to, to equate acts, uh, political acts, done by Muslims, who happen to be Muslims, in the name of their religion, to Muslims in general is a racist act. It's a race, it's a jump, right? So, uh, I mean, obviously, we don't hate white people because Jeffrey Dahmer was white. And that's what the, the or, or, you know, uh, if you look at terrorist acts before 9-11, uh, one of the biggest ones was Oklahoma bombing. So Timothy McVeigh, not all white people have to be investigated because Timothy McVeigh was a white supremacist. So that's the thing. I mean, whether or not the, the, the perpetrators of 9-11 were Muslim is almost irrelevant. That they use religion in a politicized manner is relevant, but that doesn't, it, it should not be a pretense for profiling a whole religion. Now you focus a lot of your research on Bernard Lewis and Fareed Zakaria. Can you, why do you pick them and how do they exemplify Islamophobia in your view? Right, it's a good question. You know, you asked me about uh, the 1990s. Um, in the 1990s, people like Bernard Lewis and later uh, Fareed Zakaria w would serve to give language to a lot of scattered Islamophobic tenants, okay? It, I don't want to overvalue Bernard Lewis, you know, or Fareed Zakaria, who's very savvy for Fareed Zakaria. He's very smart and very savvy, so you can see how he shifts his language in now from, say, 2001. But what they're, very, they're important in doing is that they regularized is sort of discourses and rhetorics of Islamophobia. There's more than one form of Islamophobia, right? There's more, I mean, there's this sort of really hardcore, you know, all Muslims are this and all Muslims are that and they're that and their Islam is a religion of, of the devil and, you know, all this sort of nonsense. And then there's the softer core Islamophobia, uh, which I think m most of mainstream America suffers from, which is just prejudice against Muslims. The idea that somehow Muslims are different from us. Fareed Zakaria, for example, even though he's a Muslim, perpetuates that. He predicates his analysis on the fact that Muslim communities or Muslim countries in the Middle East didn't modernize in certain ways. So he sort of regularizes a certain sort of rhetoric of what I call soft Islamophobia, as opposed to Bernard Lewis, who's a much more, uh, gives language and, and, and a narrative to the neocons, sort of Vulcan, La, uh, language of war against, you know, the Muslim world in the, in the war and terror. Do you have any examples um, from things they've written or said that sort of exemplify what you're talking about there? Yeah, I mean, the 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 pivotal piece for Bernard Lewis was um, uh, a book, uh, an article on uh, the origins of 
of Muslim rage, for example. You know, and what he does is is that he locates um, um, Arab discontent and Muslim dis discontent in their culture. Right? He locate instead of saying these are the political reasons why the Middle East um, is a mess and why people in the Middle East are angry. Rather than saying these are the historical conditions, what he'll say is Muslims are sexually frustrated. You know, most, they repress their women. Their fathers are mean to them. They have, so he, he, he sets out all these, he grabs actually all these sorts of you know, Islamophobic uh, tenets which are already out there and nicely weaves them into this sort of neat narrative that places um, uh, what's wrong with Islam inside Muslims themselves, right? He, he makes it a cultural issue. So he does that in this in this uh, this origins of uh, uh, origins of Muslim rage, which is a which is a a, 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 um, a big hit with Cheney. You know, he's always quoting it. Uh, so, um, are there ways that it sounds like that there are ways that regular Americans could be. Islamophobic in a way they might not realize it, you know. Right. Can you can you talk about some something you know where someone might have a certain view that they think is just based on, you know, values and you know, right. but really has a subtle Islamophobia behind it? Well, that's. I mean, this is the problem with racism in the United States, right? It's so ingrained and it's so hard for us to see beyond our own blinders. So, in regards to uh, Islamophobia and Muslim American uh, and Muslim Americans vis-a-vis -vis the, the mainstream, is just that, for example, that that precept right there, that equation right there. We call them Muslim Americans as if somehow that differentiates them from other Americans. The concept of, for example, tolerance, where you have a, a lot of good Americans who who say, "Well, I like them." Uh, they're good people, and you know we have Muslim friends, and so th there's always a sense of they are good, they are like us, or they're they're fine, even though they're not like us. I mean that right there is 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 a clue to somehow uh, how we how we see them as not us. You know, uh, it's it's tough because so for example, a, a one con uh, there's this uh, horrible show which is called. Uh, I think it's called American Muslim, the American fam Muslim family, you know, this reality oh, yeah, show. Yeah, I haven't seen it yet. Uh, it's, and, and it's the whole premise of the film, uh, of this series, this reality show, is that, look, they're just like us. You know, I mean, if you have that about black people, it's offensive. Or about Latinos, it's offensive. Um, and maybe it took the civil rights movement, whatever, but I mean, to sort of get us to that point, but we should, we should know by now that we, we, we shouldn't predicate a difference of other people just on their religion or skin color or, you know, where they're from. What effect do you think that sort of uh, way of thinking has effect? Uh, like, what effect does that have upon Muslims themselves, like on an individual level? I mean, I think this country over the past 10 years has largely established a fear, a culture of fear. You know, I think uh, American Muslims are generally afraid. Um, they're afraid uh, of authorities. I mean, they, because they have a long track record of cooperating with authorities, but still being targeted, right? So, for example, in Orange County, you know, there's a famous story about from a case about FBI putting in um, uh, spies and uh, agents to, prov to, to provoke people in this mosque when he this guy ends up talking a, a lot of crazy stuff about you know bombing America and all this stuff this mosque goes to um, this the Muslim American community organization care based in Los Angeles, who has relations with, with the FBI, okay? So they do what they, the, 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 the Imam of the mosque goes to care and says, we got this guy, he's a nut job, right? 
And so CARE does what they're supposed to do. They have relations with the FBI. They call up the FBI and say, you know, in this mosque in Tustin, this guy's crazy and he's talking smack. I think he's dangerous. It happens to be their man. Okay? What happens is, is that instead of pulling that guy out, they go and get some other people, sna snag some people from that mosque, and threaten them to see if they will become informants. And if they don't want to become informants, they say they're going to deport them or, 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 or charge them with terrorism or a support of a terrorist organization. In the case I'm talking about, um, the guy's like, brother-in-law was Taliban in Afghanistan. But everyone is Taliban, has no some Taliban in Afghanistan, you know what I mean? I mean it's, you know, every, it's like in the South, you know, you, everybody knows someone who probably was a racist at one time, or, you know, I mean, it's, it's just an unfortunate truth, you know? Um, so, you know, it doesn't make that person a racist, right? It does, um, I live in South Carolina, it doesn't make those people racist, it just happens you know, you know, just like the guy in Afghanistan, who his brother-in-law might have been mate, and that's might. And so, he, he, uh, thankfully, that guy ended up okay. But what happened was is that you have someone who's cooperating. You have a, a mosque who's cooperating. They do what they're supposed to do. And the FBI then comes around and still not only spies on you, then also tries to coerce. So where do you turn if you're a Muslim American? What do you do? You live in a culture of fear. Who do you trust? You know, who do you trust if the NYPD is spying on you at school, in the university? If you just go to go on a, a mosque, uh, I mean, a, 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 uh, an outing, rafting with your friends from the, the Muslim Studies Association. I mean, where do you where do you turn? So in this respect, as a Muslim America American, it's pretty pretty tough because you really don't know what you can say to whom you can say it um, without being suspect. What's what's sort of the take home message for? For Americans, what what do you want if you know if they read this book? What do you want them to take away from this book? I want to start having folks interrogate their own uh, their own prejudices, their own what we call subject position. Um, people ask me, well, you know, you're saying that. You're upset if people hate Muslims. But on the other hand, if people are trying to be really tolerant with Muslims and saying it's OK what they do, you're, you're criticizing them. Well, what should we do? <clears throat> and I think what we need to do, and hopefully this could kind of be the take home, is to stop asking questions about us and them. You know, is to start to understand phenomenon politically. Why do things happen politically? Why do things happen economically? What are the relationships between our prejudices and our privileges? What is, the, what is the relationship between our prejudices and legislation that we would not have accepted 20 years ago? You know, um, Why is it that I understand someone as different from us where I really know that if I, they had a different skin color, they wouldn't be that, I wouldn't be asking that question? And um, because I see them as different, it allows me to buy into so much other stuff, buy into the fact that, well, maybe you know, we need to be careful because you know, Al-Qaeda wants to bring the United States down, or we need to support Israel because they are against our same enemy, or because we need to have, you know, have nuclear uh, uh, energy because we need to get uh, uh, independent from Middle East oil. Right? So it, we can see how ingrained those notions are, those racist notions. So when we stop seeing the world and them and us and start to understand things politically and economically, then we can, I think, get at answers better. So, um, but, uh, you know, so, so I, I think it's really important, for example, to recognize the Islamophobia how it parallels other forms of racism, right? It parallels, you know, racism against black people. It certainly parallels racism against Latinos, especially in this day of anti-immigrant sentiment, you know? And quite frankly, Islamophobia is a terrible thing, but in, it, it, it can tell us about something that's far more dangerous and far more uh, widespread, which is 
you know, racism against uh, Latino community and this sort of vilification of this, uh, this community in the United States. So, I mean, those mechanisms are very similar. Um, again, you wanna, what you want to say is the mechanisms are very similar. What are the implications of each one? What is the, who's benefiting from each one? You know, what are the politics of each one? And then finally, if, we're, if we continue along the status quo, what, what is it going to look like in the future? I think I do not foresee, number one, the eradication of Islamophobia in, in the near future. Um, it is a convenient foil for lazy political operatives to, to deploy whenever they need it. Um, so based on the fact that I don't think Islamophobia is going anywhere, I fear that it will be further used to erode civil liberties in the United States, and it will be further used to justify American foreign policy in the Middle East. Um, it will be used to, for example, invade or bomb Iran. Um, it will be used to stay in Afghanistan. It will be used to continue intervention in African countries, which we have many bases that we, and operations that we really don't talk of. Um, so I, I'm afraid that Islamophobia is, is not going anywhere. But if we stop, if we, if we don't start to, again, question that, I'm afraid it's just going to be more of the same and which is going to result in more antagonism, uh, antagonism against the United States.